If you have your Bibles with you this evening, let's open up to the book of Numbers. And this is our fifth study in the book of Numbers. And we'll go start in chapter 7, verse 89. Chapter 7, verse 89. Let's be conscious of the time because if the weather's good enough, we're going to go do like we did last week and do a prayer walk around Yeager Elementary. <clears throat> but uh, so, so be mindful, someone be mindful of our time. Let me do give us a little review of what we saw last week, okay? Let me start out by saying this. I, I, well, I sat down to, to just finish writing stuff this, this evening or this afternoon. The Lord laid this on my heart. And I don't know exactly why. I don't know if I've ever said this before, but I know the lessons that God has laid on my heart as we do our Bible studies or Sunday morning messages. I know the, 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 what he's laid on my heart for the congregation as a whole. Sometimes he adds things, of course, as in preaching or teaching. But I don't know what the Holy Spirit has for you and for your life. We may be reading something tonight and that may be, the Holy Spirit may just speak to you. It may just be what you need to hear. And so uh, be open to the Holy Spirit. Please be open to the Holy Spirit because I've got lessons points I want to get across, but you be always mindful that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. We, we believe as Baptists in the priesthood of the believer. We believe that every believer has a direct line to God. Just as, just as, just as sure as, as the best known uh, evangelist in the world, we all have access to the same Lord Jesus Christ from the youngest child that knows him as Savior to no matter how important that we are, God hears us. Hallelujah. Okay. Then last week, last week we looked at the Nazarite vow, drawing near to God. You don't have to be a priest or a Levite to uh, draw near to God. That's the point of the Nazarite vow. Any man or woman, male or female, that wants to do a vow and pledge himself to God, God honors that. Then we saw the blessings that were pronounced on his children. Blessings of protection, pardon. Peace. Let me just read those. Man, those that's a good blessing. It just takes a second to read. Uh, but the blessing that he says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. He gives us protection. And every one of these are the T-H-E-E. -E, the, these are singular. It's you as an individual. God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. He gives you pardon. He gives you grace. And finally, he gives you peace. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So he gives us protection and pardon and peace. And then he says, and then this is plural, and they, shall uh, and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. <clears throat> Do you know how our nation is blessed? <clears throat> how our state is blessed? Our state and the nation is blessed as God blesses little individual people in the individual churches scattered across this mountain state. God's hand is blessing. God's hand is moving. Okay, then we saw them all bringing their great gifts, all the hundreds of animals they brought to be sacrificed and, and the silver and, and the gold and the incense and each tribe brought the exact same thing, each on their appointed day. And God did bless this. was to be given to the Levites to carry out and the priests to carry out the work of God. Now, starting this evening, chapter 7, verse 89. And when Moses was going into the tabernacle of the congregation, to speak with him, that should be a capital H if your Bible doesn't have it as a capital H. Speak, speak to God. That he heard the voice of one, again capital, speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. And he, he again God, spake unto him. God spoke. I love this. Moses goes expecting God to speak. And so should we. When we open our Bible, we should be expecting God to speak. Well, I don't understand. Well, that's okay. God still speaks to us. God still blesses us. Let me ask you a question. Can any of you tell me exactly what you had the first eight days of this year for dinner back in January? Probably not. But I bet if you didn't eat for eight days, you'd be hungry, okay? And I bet if you hadn't eaten all the way up through August, what is today, the 12th, you'd be very hungry. You'd be dead what you'd be. See, we may not know everything and understand everything, but we need God's word to feed us. And so Moses expected God to speak, and so should we have a high priest that hears the feelings of our infirmities. He knows all about us, and he loves us. 
So here's what he spoke to him about. That's how important this is. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, You speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps, shall give light over against the candlestick. Now, there's not a candlestick. It's a lampstand, okay? Uh, there's no, there were no candlesticks in this day. There was no candlesticks in the New Testament days. Uh, it, it's just the word, when the King James translated, it's lampstand. And Aaron did so. He uh, lighted the, the lamps thereof over against the candlestick as the Lord commanded Moses. And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, of a beaten work. Of course, we've already read in the book of Exodus, 75 pounds of pure gold. Can you imagine how expensive that is? Now, it also wouldn't be very large unless it was beaten very thin. So this is probably going on the outside of the whatever the lampstand is made of because we see a, uh, a drawing, an ancient uh, a Jewish drawing of the, of the north. It's a large lampstand. So, uh, but imagine the expense, 75 pounds of pure gold. According to the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses, so he made the lampstand. Now, let me talk about this for a second. Well... The only light that you had in the holy place was this, because remember, you had the outside tabernacle where all the sacrifices were made, the big brazen altar and all that, and then the brazen laver to wash the priest. But then you had the holy of holies that only the priest could go into. The other Jewish people couldn't. And then you had the, the, I mean, excuse me, the holy place. Then you had the holy of holies that only the high priest could go into once a year. So and it had no light at all. God lit it up when the priest went in. And that's something God lit place up. But all it had was this lampstand to light up the entire holy place. It had no natural light. And so I wrote down a few things here. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One of your favorite pastor scriptures, Psalm 119. God's word is not a natural light. <laughs> ah, God's word is a supernatural light that lights our path. When we're so confused that we don't even know what to do. We don't even know who to talk to. We don't even know what to, what to even ask God. God's word becomes a light to us. It starts shining reflections and gives us strength and anointing. And it lights as the Holy Ghost in our hearts, the holy place. The place is separated in our lives to God. In the New Testament, the church is to shine the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the true light. The light of every man that cometh into the world. But then Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 says, there are seven lampstands. And then I love this because it says to all seven churches, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what? Come on, you know this quote. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, so, so we are to be the light of the world now. So we're not to walk in the natural. They don't want to come and see how smart you are. They don't want to see how intelligent you are. They don't want to look at your ACT score, your SAT score. They want to know, what can you tell me about Jesus? You know, I know I know believers, not many, but a few, that cannot read or write. But I would trust my life in prayer to them. That they are men of God that love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their hearts. And... Uh, truly love the Lord. It's not about, now I'm not saying these men are not intelligent because they're very intelligent. They just never had an opportunity to go to school to learn to read and write. But they are men of God and, and, and I don't know any women, but I'm sure women of God also that can't. It's not a matter of what you know in this world. We're talking about supernatural light, not natural light. And so he says to light the lamp. So Aaron, as you remember from the book of Exodus, doesn't just take any light. He goes and gets fire from the holy altar and he uses it to light the lampstand. Now, because I've always thought, how cool would it have been if God said, watch this, Moses, and all the lights started lighting. You know, God could have done that, couldn't he? But he didn't. God could take away all your problems, but he's probably not going to. If he does today, you'll have more tomorrow because a man that's born of woman few of days, full of, full of sorrows, full of troubles. That's what happens to us, guys. That's what we're leaving. That's who we are. So, so, but we got the supernatural light. That's the part I want to stress in verse 89 through verse 4. Uh, we got the supernatural light of God in the Bible, in the Holy Spirit, 
We've got the supernatural light of God. In the church, the seven churches, the churches are the light. Guys, we need, we need those simple things in our lives. The word, the spirit, prayer, church attendance. Those are what makes us more like Jesus Christ. Now, we go into this section about the purification of the Levites. So what I want to do is I'm going to read this through verse 14 to start with, and then we'll stop and make some comments, and hopefully you'll see some blessings of how this applies to you in 2020. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water, purifying upon them. Let them shave all their flesh. Wow, like a cue ball. Let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean. Now, there are 22,000 Levites. We already know that. We read that just a couple weeks ago. So this will take a long time to wash all those clothes and to, and to, to, to everyone to shave. So either... A long time after God says this to Moses, several days or whatever, he does, or they do the sprinkling, and then they do the shaving and the washing later. But here's the point. God wants them to be clean. Here's what I want you to say. God wants the Levites to be clean. Let me keep reading. I don't want to, get, I don't want to let the fire out too early. I want you all to see what God is saying here. And let them take a young bullock with his meat offering. Even fine flour mingled with oil, and another young bullock shalt thou take for a sin offering. Thou shalt bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together. Thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. And Aaron shall offer, Aaron the high priest, shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering. This is a wave offering. Actually, I don't know why the King James didn't say that. It's very clear in the Hebrew. Of the children of Israel that they may execute the service of the Lord, do the work of God. And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullock. So the congregation will lay their hands upon the hands, heads of the Levites, and the Levites will go lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks. And thou shalt offer one for a sin offering, that is for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. God wants them to be holy. And thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron and before his sons and offer uh, them for an offering unto the Lord. Thou shalt separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. So let's stop right there for a second. The Levites, they're not priests. 22,000 Levites, but as we're going to see in just a few minutes, in just a minute, when we pick up reading again, they are to take the place of all the firstborn. Because God said when he delivered them from Egypt, all the firstborn are mine. But he said, well, so God does a trade. He takes the tribe of Levi in place of all the firstborn. Now, if you remember, the weird thing happened. When they counted the firstborn, there were 22,283. So God even had a plan for how to redeem those 283 that did not have a matching Levi for them. I'm not going to go over that again. It's a good lesson, though, if you want to go back and listen to it. God does not consider labor as menial or unimportant. Whether it's cleaning a church building, putting in a breaker box, driving rods into the ground, hooking up speakers, handing out groceries. God does not consider work to be unimportant. You say, well, somebody needs to be a clean if they're going to be a deacon or a Sunday school teacher. But we don't care how they live if they're going to come and uh, work around the church. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. God expects all the Levites to be as clean as all the priests. He expects us to be clean. God does not say this is important work and this is unimportant work. No. There's a difference in the work. Yes, of course there is. But God expects us to be clean regardless of what work God has called us to do. God expects us to be completely and wholly given unto him. Now if you remember in Acts chapter 6 usually people call these the first deacons. It doesn't actually say that but there's certainly a good pattern for this. It says that there arose a problem because all of a sudden they go from about 140 or so believers, 120 or so, to now they got several thousand. And people did not go back home from Passover, so they got thousands of people there they've got to feed. And so there arose a question among the Greek Jews, that is, they were, did not, they were not from Israel, but they were just as much Jews, but they were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. So there, there arose a question, how come our widows are not getting the same amount of food as the other widows? And the apostles said, we can't quit preaching the word. That's what God's called us to do. 
But you look out among you seven men, and they're pretty good boys. No, 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 that's not what he said. Seven men of honest report. Full of the Holy Ghost. Because if you know this, if you start giving stuff out, you get start giving food out, Brother Dan, you give more mashed taters to one fellow than another, <laughs> somebody's going to be mad. You better be full of the Holy Ghost. What I'm saying, trying to get across to you is, in this section here, God wants the Levites to be purified. He wants you to be purified. He wants me to be purified. It doesn't matter that I'm the pastor, the lead teacher at the church, and that someone else is uh, is the teaching the, the kindergarten class. It doesn't matter. God expects us all to be holy. God wants us all to be holy. That's that's the, that's my biggest takeaway. I don't know what the Holy Spirit will say to you, but that's my biggest takeaway I want to bring from this is that the Holy Spirit wants us to be, I mean, God wants us to be cleansed through the Holy Spirit. Verse 15. After that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering. They will, the men, these 22 Levites, 22,000 Levites will actually be an offering themselves. But shouldn't that be what we are? There's an old song, old, old song. I don't even know. It's, it's, it's over 100 years old, but I don't know how old it is. Take my life and let me be. Consecrate the Lord to thee. Take my eyes, take my tongue, take my silver, take my gold. Remember that old song? Just give myself to you, Jesus. That's what God expects. That's what God wants out of our life. For they are holy, not holy like in a sense of the Holy Spirit, they're a holy part of that. Completely, they're holy, completely given unto me from among the children of Israel, instead of such as open every womb, instead of instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel, have I taken them unto me. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both male and both man and beast. Of the, of the, uh, on the day that I smote the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. But look what happens in verse 19. It's crazy. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons. Who do the Levites belong to? God. So God has a right to do what he wants to with them. Let me question you. Does God have a right to do what he wants to with you? Yes. Sure. The answer has to be yes. Does he have a question? Does he have, uh, does he have to ask you about it? No. <laughs> I'm glad that he does lead us and guide us. But the truth of the matter is we belong to Jesus. I don't think we quite really have a good grasp of what slavery means. When it says we're a servant of the Lord, it's not the word servant in the sense of a paid servant. We are the slaves of Jesus Christ. He paid for us. He redeemed us. We belong to him. So he gives them as a gift to Aaron his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make atonement for the children of Israel. The Levites will help with sacrifices until there's more priests that are born. And there shall be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come into the sanctuary. And Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did. I love it. I love that. They did it. They didn't say they talked about it. They got a committee. Guys, you know what a camel is. Have y'all ever seen a camel? I rode one when we were in Jerusalem, right in the city of Jerusalem, looking down on the walk that Jesus took, or on the little ride that he took on the donkey. I'm riding a camel, Okay. I didn't ride very far. <laughs> Camels are tied. They're scary, okay? They like riding a horse. I don't mind riding a horse. But you know what a camel is? Somebody said a camel is a horse that's been put together by a Baptist committee. <laughs> it's about the truth. So they didn't have no committee. They didn't get together, talk about They did what God said to do. They did to the Levites according to all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites. So did the children of Israel unto them, and the Levites were purified. I love that. And they washed their clothes, and Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord. And Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, the Levites, and after that went the Levites in to do their service in the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron and before his sons, because there's not very many priests at this time, just Aaron and his sons, two of his sons 
for all this alive to his other two sons are dead because they were not faithful to God. God actually killed them with fire. And I'm, I'm sure by the time when you start looking at Aaron's age, his son's age, he's got some grandsons that doesn't name them, but that would be as far as it goes. So just a small group. And the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so they did unto them. I love that. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Now, if you remember chapter 4, verse 13, don't turn that because I'm going to tell you what it says in just a second here, okay? This is that that belongeth unto the Levites. From 20 and 5 years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. But in chapter 4, verse 13, it says, From 30 years old and up. Well, that's because. They had five years of training. Five years of training. So a Levite would start his official work when he's 25 years old as an understudy, so to speak. Then at age 30, he would actually be a full-fledged Levite. He could start doing the work of God. Now, I know that later on, because of other things, God allowed that to be changed and dropped down to 20 years old because there were some things that happened. But, and from the age of 50 shall they cease from waiting upon the service thereof, and shall serve no more. So the age 50, so from, from 25 to 30, they would be learning the work. From 30 to 50, they'd do the work. Then from age 50, they would cease from, because imagine how heavy this is to load up all those big heavy curtains and cords and boards covered with gold would weigh, it must take four or five men to carry it because they were, what, 18 inches wide? Can you imagine how heavy something like that would be? So at age 50, they quit doing that but shall minister with their brethren. So they're still allowed to minister. They just don't do the heavy carrying anymore in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge and shall do no service, so no, no, no labor. Thus shall thou do unto the Levites touching their charge. Okay, so let's stop here a second. So there's something to be said. Just because someone is older doesn't mean they're not important. Just because someone's got a little age on them, or as my secretary, I was last Thursday, my secretary came up to write some checks, one of the secretaries at school. And her little boy, Jason, I guess four, maybe five, and he so he stands under me. I love the little fellow. He loves me. And he stands there and he says, why is your build all white? <laughs> <laughs> I told him because I was an old man. He thought I was 190. I was like, well, that's, that's pretty close. Now, I feel some days, you know. But that doesn't mean that we don't have, just because somebody's got white in their hair, so somebody have no hair, whatever the case may be, doesn't mean that God doesn't have a place for you. God has a place for you. God has a work for you. It doesn't matter about your age. Well, but I'm in a wheelchair. God has a work for you. I'm blind. God has a work for you. Whatever it is, God has a work for you. God knows exactly what he wants us to do, and he'll never put more on you than you're able to bear. That, that's good. So, so I like the several takeaways here. I don't know what the Spirit of God is saying to you, but the takeaways. The next verses are about the Passover, 14 verses about the Passover. But I'm going to read verse 1 and then stop. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were came out of the land of Egypt, saying, Now, so this is a month earlier than chapters 1 through 8. Because we knew from chapter 1, he said this was the second month, the first day, that they came out since they came out. So this is, a, I don't know why it's written this way, but this is how it's written. This part of chapter 9 is happens a month before the rest of the book, before chapters 1 through 8 takes place, okay? And he's going to give some instruction about the, uh, about the Passover. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at its appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month, at the evening, you shall keep it in its appointed season, according to all the rites of it, according to the ceremonies thereof. Shall you keep it? You will keep the. You will keep this. This has held the Jewish people together for what thirty four hundred years. <coughs> Whether a Jewish person is in China or Russia or Georgia. I don't mean the st uh, country of Georgia. I'm talking about the state of Georgia or in Alabama, wherever Jewish people are, even those that are not believers, they say they're atheists, Jews take the Passover. And that's why Jews, that's one of the reasons, Jews have been kept out of the great Gentile melting pot. You take people from other countries, and they moved to southern West Virginia, whether they were from Slovakia, a lot of Slovakians moved to McDowell, Mingo County during the, after the Biden Wars, whether they were from England or, or 
or, uh, or whatever country they're from, we have this great melting pot in the United States. But the Jewish people have always remained separate. That's why people hate them so bad, for one of the reasons. Mainly it's that satanic. It's satanic to hate the Jews because God says, I'll bless those that bless you, I'll curse those that curse you. Uh, another good reason, God, I don't know if I can say this enough, I want to say this a thousand times. You cannot be a Christian, you should be. And vote for Joe Biden. He hates the nation of Israel. He supports abortion all the way through the third trimester. The lady he chose to Miss Harris to be his running mate is just as evil. People, you better wake up. You will stand before God someday. You will stand before God someday. And 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 me, I, of course, I know not everybody says they're Christians. Christians. There's many people that go to church that aren't Christians. And there are many preachers. I remember one of the largest Methodist churches in Nashville. One of the Methodist, one of the Methodist pastors came on the radio, on Christian radio, and said, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ last Sunday. He had already been to seminary. He had been pastor for over 20 years, pastor at a great, big, large, very successful church, but he never had been saved. And he was so glad that Jesus washed his sins away. There are people I understand that go to church that don't know Christ. But if you know Jesus Christ, you will stand before Christ someday. You better make sure that you're, it, that it, you can't just hide one part of your life and say, well, I'm going to be a good Christian, except I'm going to still uh, uh, take a lot of acid and drink all the liquor I want to drink. You know, I'm going to be a good Christian, but I'm going to hide this, but I'm going to vote Democrat. God, you can't do that. You just cannot do that. You cannot do that. Open your eyes, see what God is doing in your life. So, so anyhow, though the, the Jews are to keep the Passover with all the rites of it, Moses spake to the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. This is the second one. They had the first one in Egypt. Second, sad thing is we find in Joshua chapter 5, I think verse 10, but anyhow, in, in the middle of Joshua chapter 5 that they had not kept the Passover because there's God, they're thinking, God already knows though, that they can be in the promised land in just a few weeks. They will take their next Passover in the promised land. Of course, we know they sinned against God, and for 38 years they wander in the wilderness, and they don't have the Passover until they get to the promised land. How sad. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at evening in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. Here's an exciting verses right here, guys. And there were certain men who were defiled by the body, the dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We are defiled by the, by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer the offering of the Lord in its appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moses said to them, That's a problem. That's a real problem. Because these are good men. They want to do, they want to follow God. They want to do what's right. Moses said, stand still. And God, that's usually good advice when you come to something you don't know what to do. Just stand still. Pray about it. Talk about it. Think about what God. What. Now, once God gives you direction, you don't talk about it then, but you, you think, God, what, what am I supposed to do? And Moses said, I promise you, I will hear from God what the Lord commanded concerning you. Wow, he's just so confident God's going to talk to him. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying, if any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey at far off, whether it be now at the tabernacle or later on at the, at the temple in Jerusalem. Yet he shall keep the Passover to the Lord. Here's what you'll do. The 14th day of the second month at evening, so a month later, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And they shall leave none of it into morning, same word, nor break any bone of it according to the ordinance of the Passover shall they keep it. So here's two things I take away from this. Number one is God takes uncleanness very seriously. If you're going to be part of the worship, God expects you to be clean. God expects you to be clean. If you can't take the Passover if you're unclean, because he could have just said, oh, well, this one day a year, if you touch a dead body, we'll let it slide. But that's not what he says. He says, no, this is very serious. I expect when you come to worship me to be clean. I know we just talked about that, but it's not my fault. I didn't write this stuff. I'm just teaching it, Okay. So we need to be clean. As he hit this again, we need to be clean. That's how it's, God takes this pretty serious, but he also provides a very gracious way, full of mercy and love, that you're not knocked out of doing this. Guess what you can do? You can take the Passover the exact same way, same day of the month, one month later, 
And so here's my second takeaway from this. There was a man named Joseph of Arimathea that will be born long after this. And a man named Nicodemus is going to be born long after this. And on Passover, because remember, I understand Jesus and his disciples took the Galilean Passover because there were so many people in Jerusalem that actually had to do Passover two days. And that's all right because it's how the evening falls. It can be both days. But anyhow, I don't want to get into taking a half hour to explain that. But be in mind, Jesus did not do anything wrong. Jesus took Passover that day along with thousands of others. It wasn't wrong to do. Jesus would never do anything wrong. But Nicodemus and, and, jo and Joseph of Aramath, they had touched the dead body that day, didn't they? The dead body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I wish we could have done that work. I wish we could have been there. But these men were there. And God knew before they was ever born what they would be. They touched that dead body. I wonder, because they sort of just fade off. I wonder if a month later they hadn't lost all their wealth. We do know from church history that they died broke. I mean, completely destitute because the Jews, they were very wealthy men. But I wonder if a month later they sat down and they took the Passover. I sure they did because they were very religious men. Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. And uh, I wonder if they talked, man, we met the Lamb of God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? A month later, if everybody else is taking the Passover, I'm sure there's other, probably several hundred people across the Jerusalem have taken it because they're defiled for one thing or another. But these two men and their families take the Passover because of the body of Jesus. I think that's cool. I really just think that's cool. I think that's something else. Okay, so, but if a man that is clean is not in a journey and forbear to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off. You don't get a second chance. You can't wait till a month later. Say, well, maybe I'll feel better. No, 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 no. If you don't know what God says, says you'll be cut off. Now, it's about equal. About half the time when it says it, it means you'll be killed. Sometimes it means you'll be excommunicated from Israel. You have to live outside the camp for the rest of your life. So I don't know whether it means they'll be put to death or they'll be, either way it's a bad thing. They will be cut off from, from among his people because he brought not the offer of the Lord in the appointed season. That man shall bear his sin. So it sounds like there must be, I don't know, of course, it could be bearing it by night. I don't know. And if a stranger, because there were a lot of Gentiles <laughs> that are saved through the years and became Jews because that's how you were saved them before Jesus Christ came. If a stranger shall sojourn among you and shall keep the Passover to the Lord according to the ordinance of the Passover, according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. You have one ordinance, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land, so it doesn't matter. God doesn't change the rules. Guys, I love what the Apostle Paul says in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. He said, there are some people that have died because they have taken the communion of the Lord unworthily, not not that unworthy, because we're none worthy, okay? They did it in the wrong manner. They did it in the wrong way. And I think about I, I keep going back. I know you've heard me say this before. I, my first year in Nashville, when I saw this article in the paper, not that I could afford a paper, but someone left one at school and I picked it up, okay? And uh, and the one of the Catholic churches in town said, we have Friday night uh, mass, they don't call it the Lord's Supper because it's not the Lord's Supper. They actually believe it's actually in the body of Jesus Christ and blood of Jesus Christ. Said, I, I, I read it, I read it, but I read it. took something else to read. If you'll take three Friday night masses in a row, you'll go to heaven no matter what you ever do in life. And so, the person writing this article was making comments on it. It said that he went to that Catholic church and they were taking people, men and women, up so drunk and doped out of their head they couldn't even stand up so they could take the communion priest would give them the communion or the or the or the, what they call the sacrament and uh, so they could be short of going to heaven now guys that's the wrong way to take it you take it knowing that Jesus Christ is the answer there are, there is un unworthy ways to take it none of us are worthy that's not what Dawson said it's, it, remember it's an adverb not a not an adjective okay, now so here's how they're going to do it. They shouldn't have done it for 38 years, but they're going to. The cloud of guidance. On the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. At evening, there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, an appearance of fire unto the morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day, the appearance of fire by night. So let me stop right there for a second. The journey. 
God is going to guide them on their journey. They should be in the promised land in just a few weeks. Of course, they will sin, and God still loves them and still forgives them. He's already set them up in armies. Remember, that's what this is all about, 600 some thousand fighting men. Got them set up by their standards. They're ready to go into the promised land, and God is going to give them victory over all their enemies. But, of course, we know they don't do that, right? They do what we do. They didn't follow God like they should. And so, so instead of this being for just a few weeks, it's 38 years. God still does give them that victory, by the way, when they get there. Hallelujah. But, so God has got them broke up in armies and, the, and the, uh, all these things, but what grace he shows to them. So, uh, this, this is a quote from Jeremiah chapter 10. I said, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in a man who walks to direct his own steps. That's right. Not, we can't direct our own steps. God has to do that. And I always, when I, I send out an email or a text to somebody, if I'm, you're somebody that I'm communicating with, you'll have a TLW, the Lord's will will do this. The Lord's will will do that. And uh, remember when I was writing low tech fashion letters, it took a long time. Brother Mason wrote me a letter. I'm not Mason a letter back. And finally, after a few months, he said, what is TLW? <laughs> I said, the Lord's will Brother Mason. So, and of course, he believed that. He just didn't know my crazy. That was before everybody abbreviated everything. This was 1993, okay? So, so God is abiding. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that, the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there's a very special word. It's the word Shekinah. Shekinah. I remember after the first time I ever mentioned that word, Sister Glenda. What in the world is Shekinah? I never heard that. I've been in church all my life. Well, you didn't teach us something weird at this church. I said, Shekinah is the glory of God. She said, I've never heard that before. I said, well, you're going to hear it quite a bit as long as I'm pastor here. Because Shekinah means the abiding, the, uh, the weight, the glory of God. There the children of Israel pitched their tents. So they pitched their tents there. So the Shekinah glory of God, God's presence is there. The cloud covered them by day, never covered their adversaries, and so they were in a shade. They had light by night. I don't mean a bright light so they couldn't sleep, but they're, think about how big a camp would be that had two million people in it. It would be miles and miles, wouldn't it? And yet the Jewish people were, he tells them exactly how when they use their restroom, how to cover stuff up, what to do at night, all these things. God lights up. God is, you say, I don't believe this. Well, I don't care. If you don't believe this, you probably believe another stuff in the Bible. God lit up the camp at night, and God covered them by a cloud in the day. And what was the point of that was to protect them and show them and love them and care for them, give them uh, this special anointing. But also it was to lead them because when it came time to move, they had to move. The commandment of the Lord, children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they pitched. Uh, seven times it's going to say, from verse 18 through verse 23, at the commandment of the Lord, at the commandment of the Lord, at the commandment of the Lord, at the commandment of the Lord. At the commandment of the Lord, they pitched as long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle. They rested in their tents. Man, that sounds good to rest in your tent, doesn't it? Huh? Doesn't this sound good to rest in your tents and have peace? I'm not talking about putting your feet up and resting. That way I'm talking about to have a peace that passes all understanding. That's what our nation needs. It's what we all need. When the cloud tarried long among uh, upon the tabernacle many days, and the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. So I'm sure if the cloud stopped for one night, they didn't go setting up all their tents. That would take a lot of time, maybe a couple of days to do so. But when the cloud settled, and they said this is where God wanted them to be, that they would they would put out their tents and cattle and all this. Can you just a massive undertaking moving that many people? And so it was when the cloud was a few days upon the time, according to the uh, commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents. And towards the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. I love that. I keep saying that too. They journeyed, they journeyed. Because this is a journey. Let me go to the end of my notes here. They journeyed. Church, we're on a journey. We really are. We're pilgrims on a journey. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need to come for worship. We need to come to study the Word of God. We need to be vocal in our, our, the morals of our society are crumbling all around us. I, 
things I've been saying, I didn't know anybody else was saying five years ago that that before long, just like homosexuality was pushed to be legalized and normalized, that it would be pushed to be normalized and legalized to have sex with children. Guys, read what's going on the last few weeks. It, it's, I thought this would be, if I was, I, I know I've been preaching that for five years or more, but I thought it'd be 20 years in the future, or maybe after the church was gone. It's now. We live in, in a wicked and terrible time. We live in a wicked and a terrible time. So they journeyed. Uh, verse 21, and so it was with a cloud abode from evening to morning that the cloud was taken up in the morning they went. And then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night. So someone had to be always on guard. 24-7, 360. I didn't say 365 because they only had 360 days in their year. So always, every hour of the day, someone's job was to watch the cloud. That'd be cool to watch the glory of God Somebody's job was to watch the glory of God. Whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not, but was taken up, they journeyed. Now, you say, what, why does he say years? Because Moses writes this after the fact that they have sinned and time has passed on. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. That's a good life to live right there. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. What time is it, guys? 8.03. Somebody was supposed to stop me at 5 till. Raise my hand up. Oh, I can't, you have to, yeah, I raised up here. I didn't see. Okay, so we need, we need to stop. I, I told Jeremy that we would get through verse 10 of chapter 10, but also <laughs> the first 10 verses of chapter 10 ties chapter 9 and 10 together, so it don't matter which week we're doing it. But we're going to stop right there. We're going to end our, our Facebook time. Then we'll take time for questions before we go over to the, we've got several minutes, before we go over to the uh, to the grade school, if, if weather's permitting, to, uh, to have our prayer walk, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we end this time together with uh, our Facebook, I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to our people's hearts. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to people tonight. I just see all these beautiful lessons here from my life, some of them we shared tonight. I pray, Lord God, you'd help us to be more like you and less like ourselves. God, I pray that you bless our nation. Please bless our nation, Lord God. Please bless our nation. Let Christians stand up. Let us stand with our brothers and sisters in California and Nevada who are being fined and persecuted. I never thought I'd see this, and not this quickly, in our day and time, uh, taking their gun permits away from them, not letting them join the military, all these things just because they want to go out to the house of the Lord. Bless our brothers and sisters. Give them courage. Let us stand with them, Lord God. As long as it's possible, Lord, we're going to be in the house of the Lord, bringing honor and glory to your holy name. Help us, Lord God, to do your will. We love you. We praise you. Again, bless our prayer list, the great list of names we added this evening. In Jesus' name.